Aloha and welcome back to Movement Matters on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Christine Linders, your host and physical therapy orthopedic clinical specialist. I'm broadcasting remotely today as we continue to hunker down to slow the spread of COVID-19 in our community here in Hawaii and worldwide. I've been home and out of the office now for three and a half weeks and I am honored to have a super guest today because of all she's done and contributed to the physical therapy profession. Dr. Mary Massery has been a physical therapist for over 43 years, achieved her doctorate in physical therapy as well as her doctor of science, and has been invited to give over 900 presentations in the United States as well as 18 countries abroad. Her research pioneered the concept of managing trunk pressures as a new way to visualize core stabilization. She earned the highest of honors at the American Physical Therapy Association Awards, the Florence Kendall Practice Award for Outstanding and Enduring Contribution to the Profession of Physical Therapy. Let me welcome Dr. Mary Massery to talk about the diaphragm and how to use it not only to breathe, but to enhance posture and balance and decrease reflux and low back pain. Welcome, Mary, and thank you so very much for joining us on Movement Matters today. You're welcome, Christine. I'm happy to be here. How, how are you doing in Chicago and your family? Is everybody safe? Yeah, everybody is safe here. And I think for the most part, everyone is adhering to the guidelines. Nobody wants to get this disease. So people are being pretty good, pretty respectful, and we're just going to have to navigate it as, as the uh, virus lets us and then see, see what happens. I think everyone's going to be pretty nervous when they really say you can go back to work. It'll be like, uh, can we? Should we? How about if we let you go first and, I know. and I'll I, go second? <laughs> that's, that's the concern. Um, so how have you been staying busy at home? I understand there's a favorite thing you have to do while you're hunkering down. Is that right? Well, there's several things. There's one, my daughter and her husband and two very young kids, a two-year-old and a newborn baby. Oh, uh, who, yeah, they live in Chicago down in the heart of the city and they moved up with us. We're in the suburbs to quarantine with us so they could get some extra help. And also because we have more space. You know, yeah. I'm in a suburb, so there's more green areas, there's forest preserves, et cetera. And in the city, they closed everything. So a poor two year old would have nowhere to go. So that's one and my favorite thing because I get to have the two year old and the baby girl. That's wonderful. Um, and the other is that I have to bake bread all the time. Oh. I mean, why, why not, right? You're going to do something during quarantining. So I get up and I make bread. And now the two-year-old archer gets up and says, Grandma, make soda bread with <laughs> archer. And like, how are you going to say no to that? So, yeah, that's been, that's been really fun to uh, kind of pick that back up. Uh, I used to make bread a lot and I got too busy and, and just didn't make it very often. And now, now I'm doing it about every other day. I love it. I was looking at that picture. He's the two-year-old. He is yeah. so adorable. And congratulations on the Thank new you. grandchild. Thank you. Thank you. So I met you briefly in a seminar in 2017 in New York. I went down for one day because I said, let me take this course. I've been wanting to take one of your courses for a long time. And I was trying to validate some information on the transverse abdominis that I wrote this book on, which I thought would publish then. And it's going to, thanks to the COVID-19, I'm going to be able to get it published eventually in the next month. But I was so fascinated at your seminar. I just did the one day then, and then I eventually went to South Carolina and took the three day. But the diaphragm, I just really had no idea how many miraculous functions it had. And you've been studying this for forever what Ever, forever what fueled your passion to start looking into diaphragm postural control like how did you get there i know isn't that kind of funny like why what would it need <laughs> to do that um i went to physical th therapy school at northwestern which is in chicago and i went very specifically because they taught pnf Okay. And for those of you who don't know that, it's proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. It's just one way to approach exercise. But I had had two knee surgeries as a teenager. And the first rehab was horrid. I went once. 
I went once, I crawled out to the curb in front of the hospital and sat on the curb and cried until my mommy picked me up and then I went home. I'm like, okay, that's it. I'm never going back to PT. That's so, the pain and torture part, right? That they blame yeah. us for being, right? <laughs> it was definitely a pain and torture and it was actually really inappropriate. If it happened today, I'd be like, okay, I'm yanking your license. Anyway, oh it was a long, long time ago. Uh, so then about a year later, I needed the other knee to have knee surgery and went to the same doctor, but did not go back to that hospital for PT. So I went to a different hospital. And when the therapist came in and outpatient, I was like this, <laughs> like ready to karate chop her if she came anywhere near me. <laughs> and so she said, are you a little defensive? I said, no. I am very defensive. And she was like, okay, then let me just take a look at your knee. And I'm like, no, you can look at the other knee. And she's like, okay, fine. I don't need to look at the knee that just had surgery. I'm like, good, because I'm not going to let you touch it. And then she started to use PNF on what was then my good knee. And it made my bad knee start to move. And I said, oh, that's really cool. And it doesn't even hurt what are you doing? What is it called? And she said, it's called PNF. And I said, where do you learn it? She said, Northwestern. I said, okay, I'm going to be a PT and I'm going to go to that school. So that's that, unbelievable. Yeah. So I applied to one school because it never occurred to me as a stupid young kid. It yeah. didn't occur to me that maybe they didn't want me. <laughs> it's like, well, I want you. So, you know, you should want me because I'm going to be amazing. You know, so, we have that in common. I applied to one school too. And I actually didn't get in the first time. I applied like late admission. And they said, no, I was already there. And, uh, but they said, but if you, you know, I was being an actuary at the time. They said, if you get a, this grade in your anatomy class, then we'll accept you in the summer. So I just, I did. And I got in, but I didn't, I didn't think for a second they wouldn't take me. I had great grades. I was doing great in school. And why apply to more than one school? I was already there. All right. <laughs> So anyway, in school, I, I was very interested in neuro. Orthopedics hadn't really been invented yet, which was hysterical. That's a whole different story. But the last class that I took, so it's, it was a one-year program, and then you did clinicals. That's just the way it was set up in 1977. So the last class at the end of the day was cardiopulmonary. I was taught by Donna Fraunfelter, who was an oh amazing teacher and still teaching. So she graduated in 1969. So she's been a PT for over 50 years and she's still teaching in Chicago. So, so for those of you out there listening, if you ever get a chance to take a course or hear a lecture from Donna Fraunfelter, make it a priority. Anyway, yeah, we well, should have her on your show. There you go. Okay. Anyway, Donna gets there the first day and, and it's spring semester. It's the last class of the day. And she said, what are you guys going to be going into as therapists, you know, pediatrics or outpatient, inpatient, et cetera. And she's having us all raise hands. And she said, well, let's see if any of you need to learn cardiopulmonary because I didn't hear anybody say they were going into cardiopulmonary therapy. And you know that she's pulling your leg. You just don't know how she's going to do it. And so we're all looking around like, yeah, that's right. We've never even heard of cardiopulmonary. She said, well, of the patients you're going to see in pediatrics and outpatients and all the rest, how many of them have hearts and lungs? <laughs> and we just looked at her and she's like, well, then you all have to stay and learn. So I like it. I, I loved it. So for me, by default, by default, I learned cardiopulmonary by one of the country's best teachers. So I left Northwestern with two primary focuses. One was breathing and one was neuro. And then my first job was at the Rehab Institute of Chicago, which was primarily um, adult neuro to start with, eventually pediatric, and particularly spinal cord injury. That's what I started on. And I just looked at every one of them when I came in. I'm like, okay, I don't know anything because I'm a new grad. But what I can see is none of them are breathing efficiently. What can we do about it? And, and the thinking at that time was more along the lines of they're going to wind up with pneumonia, but it's okay. They go back to the acute care hospital. They work on airway clearance. They you know, make them better and send them back. And I just looked and I said, okay, again, I don't know anything. Yeah. 
but wouldn't it make more sense to try mm -hmm. not to have them get sick? And they said, okay, kid, your job, you want it? I was like, oh my God, you guys are being so nice. <laughs> I, love it. I didn't realize they weren't being nice. They were dumping all the patients on me. And I'm thinking they are just so kind to really be concerned about my career <laughs> development. But the beauty of that was since nobody wanted to treat patients who had pulmonary problems, mm -hmm. it gave me one after another after another until I could really see patterns and to see the multi-system involvement wow. um, and to look at breathing in a very different way. So it, it wasn't what I set out to do, but it's yeah. what happened because that was my background. And I've always been a puzzle doer and a detective. Yeah. So it just fit right down my lane. I mean, yeah, that's that's so impressive. I love it. The figure things out. It's it's something mm -hmm. that kind of fueled me to study the different things that I've studied too, is I like to I like to figure out how I can help people even if I don't know how. And I think you've just really killed it with that. So this this I gotta talk about the soda, the soda can, soda pop yeah. can model. We have a picture of that if we can throw that up there. This uh, was a great explanation of how the trunk pressures work. And I think from my experience, I don't know that I ever really thought about vocal folds. My, I, I did the same thing. I was into rehab. My first job for the first four and a half years was acute rehab. I worked with strokes and spinal cord injuries and vent wean programs and burns and things like that. But mm -hmm. we would have people talking and we worked with speech therapists who were training the swallow and all that kind of stuff. But I never really thought of it like you've presented it and why I was doing the things that I was doing to try to gain that postural control with either talking or until I took your class, the why. And so can you explain this soda can? Sure, sure. Um, one of the things that was very apparent to me very early on is that you can't treat breathing as if it is separate from the rest of the body. I mean, it's just, when you actually say it out loud, it's embarrassing to say <laughs> it out loud. Of course, of course, breathing is part of everything we do since yeah. it's there 24 hours a day for our entire life. So it just forced me to look at patients from more of a multi-system perspective. You know, was the problem really neurologic or did the neurology cause an impairment to cardiopulmonary and cardiopulmonary was now the major problem, or did it travel to a different body system? So eventually, uh, when I went to graduate school, I was trying to really help people understand this more in terms of how to put it into a whole perspective. And our final assignment in my doctoral program was to come up with a model of postural control and you had to present it to your classmates and to some esteemed colleagues, and it was it was a big deal. And my my team my classmates made me go last because they said you're entertaining. I'm like, okay, that's not fair. And they were like, well, but you are entertaining, so we're making you go last because we're I don't all stressed out. <laughs> I know. I said, I don't really think that's fair because that means I have to go last. They're like, oh well, so what? So. <laughs> I went last and I, I used a, a model that I was trying to be very doctoral in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were lines and graphs and arrows and everything else. And I put the central nervous system you know, right out in front. And my classmate said, but you don't really believe that. I'm like, guys, it's a neuro doctorate. So we're talking neuro. They're like, but you don't believe that. You believe cardiopulmonary and physiology drives all motor behaviors. We all know that from you. So if your model doesn't reflect what we know you to truly, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to rip my hair out. Is it's the end of the doctoral program? I'm going to kill them. Um, but it was actually great because they they were forcing me dig deeper. How is it that you're going to explain? what you really believe happens. Wow. And, and that is absolutely true, that physiology drives everything. We don't have to walk, we don't have to talk, we don't have to play volleyball. Yes. We must, we must breathe, 
we must mm -hmm. eat, we must pee, poop, and sleep. And that's actually all we have to do. So I yes. went home, I went home from that presentation and very frustrated that I'd spent so much time on it. My kids had just come home from college. We're sitting in our kitchen. We've got a recycle bin right there because everybody was in and out with friends. And they're taking their cans of pop and throwing them in the recycle bin. And it just hit me. It's like, wait a minute. I know exactly what I need to show them. I said, sorry, I have to go write a dissertation. I'll be right back. <laughs> and I oh left. My gosh. And it was hours and hours. I rewrote my entire uh, postural control model. It's like, it's really all about pressure. And that was the like epiphany on how to be able to explain it. So once you look at that model, and I don't know if your colleague can bring that back. Oh, there up. it is. Yep. Okay. So if you don't mind leaving that there for a minute, if you think of a soda pop can, you know that it's, it's only strength is really the pressure that's within because the, the can itself is very weak. You could crush it if the it's pop thin. top is open. Yeah, it's very thin, but it actually is functionally strong because of pressure. So you have the diaphragm in the center, you've got the thoracic cavity and abdominal cavity beneath it. You've got to have two other valves or any pressure within the can would just fall out anytime the diaphragm moved. So your diaphragm's your internal valve. Mm -hmm. You look at the vocal folds on top, they're the ones that depending on what you need, how much air do they let leak out? It's like the neck of a balloon. So oh, anywhere from, it. Oh, it is, it is. So, it, you know, the vocal folds are in position to either let the air passively fall out or to close it, that's breath hold, yeah. or to be somewhere in between. And that's voicing is really a, a typical explanation or example of it. Um, then you come all the way down to the pelvic floor. If I don't have a valve on bottom, anytime I cough, sneeze, yell, push, I'm going to lose pressure through the pelvic floor or anywhere else where I have a breach in pressure. That was an absolute epiphany. And it really allowed me to show people that core activation is way, way, way beyond the stomach muscles. That's what everybody thinks of. I got to get my core activated. That means doing a plank. It's like, does not. Maybe what you need is pelvic floor or vocal folds or intercostals or diaphragm, or maybe you need the stomach muscles or back muscles, or maybe you need to learn how to control all of them together so that your pressure is modulated the way that you need it to perform that task to support your physiology as well as your motor skill from being a top level athlete to maybe the old person just trying to go from sit to stand. That is so brilliantly put from such a super guest. <laughs> I'm going to rewind this. I'm going to rewind this, Mary, and I'm going to quote that and stick it in my mastery <laughs> section of my book. <laughs> Oh, that's a, such a great explanation and so mm -hmm. brilliant to uh, come up with the soda can. But let me let me ask you this because I'm dying to know. I'm a visual person. Were they crushing the can and throwing it in the recycle bin or were they just throwing the empty can in there? No, they were crushing it. They were crushing it and uh, they were stomping on it. They were doing stupid college things, which is <laughs> to hit it against your I don't know what you're talking frontal about. lobe. And I'm looking and I'm going, do you really want to decrease executive function? I don't think that's a good idea. You should not be smashing it against your cranium. I mean, that's, that's then, a scary thing. I've never done that, but also, you know, I'm not a macho guy, right? And I'm pressing people. <clears throat> so I just looked at him and I said, yeah, well, you guys might think you're strong, but your mom is so strong that she can crush metal in her bare hands. And then that was the epiphany. It's like, right, but I can only do that and there's no pressure from within. So if we're not looking as, as PTs, when we look at core stabilization and we think stomach muscles, stomach muscles, we're doing an incredible disservice to our patients. And a, a great example of that would be my patients with cystic fibrosis. They clearly have lung disease. So I'm gonna be doing true cardiopulmonary, or you would think of classic uh, cardiopulmonary work with them but they're also going to be very likely to wind up with stress incontinence unless you prevent it. They have abs of steel 
because they cough 50, 100, 200 times a day. So cough, 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 cough. They've got really strong abs. That's not the problem. The problem is you're squeezing the cylinder in the middle, but you didn't roll up the bottom of that can. So think of it like a uh, tube of toothpaste. If you squeeze it in the middle, the pressure is going to go down and the pressure is going to go up. So until recently, which would have been maybe the last 10 to 20 years, which is pretty recent for cystic fibrosis, it was about two thirds of women would have stress incontinence by the time they were in their later teens. Of course, they didn't talk to their doctors about it because they were teenage girls. So who wanted to talk about it? Uh, But when they did finally start talking about it, they thought it was something completely separate from their CF. It's like, no, you're coughing. So think of it in terms of multi-system. It's because you had a lung disease, which caused a neuromotor plan of I need to cough and I need to cough aggressively to keep my lungs clear, which caused a musculoskeletal deficit of inadequate strength and support for the pelvic floor, which caused an internal organ problem of inability to hold your urine. So they're far more likely to get a urinary tract infection as well. So if I'm the doctor, I could treat the urinary tract infection, or I could say, huh, I wonder why they get that urinary tract infection. It could have a million other things as the root cause, but one of the things that the doctor as well as the therapist should be looking at is being that reverse detective. I have a urinary tract infection. I'm going to ask some more questions. Oh yeah, it does turn out they have stress incontinence, but I know they have cystic fibrosis. I know that's aggressive coughing and and excessively high intra-abdominal pressures rather than too low and be able to back that up to say, There might be a physiologic reason for the UTI, but there is definitely a physical contribution to that UTI as well. It it changes your entire practice because it forces you to find the real problem. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, I'm going to treat a shoulder problem because they came in complaining of shoulder pain or back pain or ankle pain, it makes you look and say, but is that the root? Is that the real problem. I love it. I love it. I like what you said about the reverse detective thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important to find the root cause. And I mean, absolutely. And people are always asking me, well, why are you working on this? That's not where it hurts. And I have to tell them, but you know, what we found is that this part stiff, this is not moving, this is not strong, which is making this more vulnerable or not able to move. And so we need to fix this so that doesn't have to cry out in pain. And in this reverse detective that you're talking about, I think is is genius. It's something that I always inspire other therapists and friends and students to to think about it with their, you know, if they're new and they're doing a new eval. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, tell their patient, this is a team and we're going to figure out why you're having this pain. And so I think it's this, this, or this, but you need to keep, we need to have this conversation so that I think you don't want to bark up the wrong tree. When you're new, you can't just find out the root right. and reverse detective it right away. It takes experience and time. And I know that, and you know that. Yeah. Yeah. But I try to tell them that, like, just you talk to your patient about, we're going to figure out the root cause of why you're having that pain. It might not be where the pain is right. or where the problem is. My colleague, Nakama Kerman, who is a, one of my, her. yeah, she's one of my, oh yeah, you would have met her as your teacher for the full I, course. South Carolina, yes. Yes. So she's from New York and uh, she is one of my faculty members and she just has a great saying that she heard from someone else and that is where it hurts, it works. So they yes. come in complaining of shoulder, neck, back, foot, knee, hip pain Uh, But that is very likely where it works. Where is it dysfunctional that is causing another place in your body to have to pick up the slack and do more work? So it's just, it's a great saying. But just thinking along along those lines, I I just submitted a, a presentation for the APTA on COVID. 
So we're doing something called the PACER project, which okay. is- Okay, I wanted is, to ask about that. Yeah, it's called Post-Acute COVID Exercise and Rehabilitation. I had to go through it in my mind. PACER, P-A-C-E-R. Right, so everyone's calling the APTA and calling cardiopulmonary specialists and saying, if I get a patient who is a survivor of moderate to severe COVID, because you're not going to get someone who was mild because they barely even noticed they had it, but somebody who had a more serious case, what are going to be the issues that I uh, would have to think about? And of course, we don't know. We don't know because it's novel, but we're projecting what might be occurring. And so in that video, which will be posted later today on the um, Curdy Pulmonary and Vascular Sections uh, YouTube page and Facebook oh, and all those other mediums that I don't even know about. Um, but anyway, the whole point from my perspective is that it's going to be multi-system and they're going to come in with something like low back pain. And I'm going to say, well, is their diaphragm working? It was paralyzed when they were at their sickest point. You're going to have to strengthen their diaphragm as part of your low back pain program. So it's being able to look multi-system, how cardiopulmonary affects musculoskeletal and how musculoskeletal affects cardiopulmonary and all the other systems uh, together. But it, it makes it very exciting, very exciting to be a PT. I still love my profession and I'm never going to retire. <laughs> and you're so good at, so you're so good at that. So Mary, we, we're out of time and I love, uh, I have to have you on again. To, so we can continue this conversation. I, I love what you just said about the breathing and the back pain. And I hope that the viewers today heard that message. So I want to thank you so much for coming on. I really hope I can convince you to come on maybe in two weeks when I'm on again. Sure. And thank you. Thank you. Thank Tech Hawaii and our sponsors and donors for allowing us to be here today. And during this difficult time, everybody, please be safe do some breathing think about your diaphragm now and maybe maybe in a couple weeks or if i can convince mary to come back on we'll give you some uh lovely inspiring breathing exercises to do aloha everyone thank you so much mary thank you you're welcome bye bye <laughs>